Thank you for the invitation. Very glad to be here. I'm Giovanni Chiarini. I'm the current university scholar in Texas, in the United States, in Texas Tech University School of Law and the Center for Military Law and Policy. I'm also an attorney admitted to the International Criminal Court list of assistance to counsel and an international fellow of the National Institute of Military Justice in Washington, D.C. Is it my audio clear? Can you hear me clear? We do hear you clear, Professor. Yes, we can. OK. So before joining Texas Tech, I was visiting researcher in several universities, such as Edinburgh, Cork in Ireland, Warwick in England, and Cologne in Germany. Uh, today I'll be talking about the evolution of international criminal procedure and the crime of ecocide. You know, nowadays we are talking about ecocide as the genocide of the environment. Uh, ecocide is not yet inserted in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, but it will be soon, in my opinion, and it will be probably the most serious crime together with genocide in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So today I'll be talking about ecocide, but I will do it uh, in a quite general perspective and starting this introduction on international criminal procedure. So I'll be dividing the discussion in four parts. Essentially, the first part would be focusing on the basic principle of international criminal law and procedure. The second part is a brief account on the history of ecocide. And the third part, is the recent proposal of the Stop Ecocide Foundation to introduce the crime of ecocide in the Rome Statute. And then lastly, in the fourth part, I will talk about additional integrative proposal only on procedural issues uh, with an international criminal procedure perspective. So, to fully understand the notion of international criminal procedure we should start from the history of international criminal trials. In this picture, you know, is the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. The Treaty of Versailles is essential to understand the origin of international criminal justice. Usually, scholars tend to believe that the origin of international criminal justice is to be found in Nuremberg trials, this is true, but it's not quite complete because the origin of international criminal procedure, on the contrary, is to be found in the trial of the Kaiser, in the failed trial of the Kaiser. The Kaiser was William II, the German emperor. In 1919, in the Treaty of Versailles, Article 227 and 228 stated that a special international tribunal will be constituted to try the Kaiser, consisting of five judges from the US, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, namely the victor's power. But in the end, they never established this special international tribunal. Because the, the Kaiser fled to the Netherlands, he obtained asylum, and this attempt to constitute a special international tribunal was a total failure. Uh, this failure constitutes the modern origins of international criminal procedure. Now I explain you why. First, I want to show you some satira that was common in Europe, also within the jurists. This was the Kaiser in 1919, as designed by Russian, as the evil of mankind that has to be tried in an international tribunal. This is another satire about European football playing with the Kaiser waiting for his process before this special tribunal. And this image, I hope you can see clearly, and is the so-called Leipzig trials. So the trial of the Kaiser failed, 
the special tribunal were never constituted, and they choose to constitute this process in Leipzig to try the German soldiers by a national court in Leipzig. It was the Supreme Court on Germany at that time. The problem was, out of 20,000 Germans to be tried, do you know how many of them were tried? Only 22. And the highest sentence was three years of imprisonment, which was never carried out. So Leipzig trials was a total disaster because they never established the Special International Tribunal. At this moment, the international community understood that international criminal justice was an instrument probably essential to face huge trials in the aftermath on a world war. This was the Supreme Court of Leipzig nowadays, and it was the where the trial of Leipzig were carried out in 1918. Anyway, the international community, we know the next step of international criminal justice is the Nuremberg trial. This that you can see is the Nuremberg trial and the Nuremberg court. So, as you surely know, Nuremberg trial, I don't want to spend too many words, uh, but it's essential in the affirmation of international criminal procedure because it's the first international tribunal with a statute. The Nuremberg trial statute consists of 30 articles. There was not a real code of rules of procedure and evidence actually, but Nuremberg is still very interesting. It was also the first experience of simultaneous translation in a criminal trial in the world. Imagine how it was difficult to translate four different languages, Russian, German, French, and English in 1945. It was the first experience of simultaneous translation in a criminal trial. Uh, it wasn't a real international criminal tribunal. It was more an international military tribunal. That's why it's called IMT. It's International Military Tribunal. So the procedure was very narrow. Uh, I told you only 30 articles. Judges could create norm of, of criminal procedure, so something which is very far from our legal culture. But this procedure is still very interesting, and it was the first experiment of a clash of legal culture, of a blend between different legal cultures, such as the common law from the British, the common law from the American, which is very different, and the Roman civil law from the French, the German, and the Russian. This was the first experiment of clash of legal culture. One of very interesting example of this blend of legal culture was the dissenting opinion. As you know, the dissenting opinion is a procedural instrument typical of the common law, especially in the US, which allow judges in the Supreme Court of the US to issue dissenting opinion and attach this dissenting opinion to the judgment itself, where they explain their own reason to dissent from the main judgment. Or they can also issue separate opinion, concurring opinion, if they agree with the judgment, but they disagree with the reasoning that underlined the judgment. In Nuremberg, do you know the only one dissenting opinion issued from which we issued? It wasn't issued by the British or by the American, but by the Russian. So a uh, legal culture very far from the common law. This is, was the first dissenting opinion in the history of international criminal trial. Judge Nitichenko from the Soviet Union issued the first dissenting opinion in the history of international criminal law, saying in a very Russian way <laughs> that all the defendant shall be convicted to the death penalty. No acquitted, no life sentence, only the death penalty. 
it's a four page dissenting opinion, which is quite interesting. And Judge Nitichenko in Nuremberg trial uh, was very famous in uh, the Stalin environment. Anyway, was a general, but was also a jurist. Let me go to the next uh, presentation. I'm using two screens, so I'm quite slow. As you can see, another important mark in the international criminal procedure is the composition of the bench. You can also see here a symbol of different legal culture. While British and Americans are wearing robes, the Russian judge on the left is wearing his military dress. This was another underrated trials where scholars usually criticize Nuremberg trials for the lack of guarantee. I always show these pictures. This is a trial called Dachau trials. It took place in the concentration camp in Dachau a couple of months after Nuremberg trial. And this was a poorly military trial. Namely the trial that we were used of this year. So Nuremberg was something new in the panoramic of military trial. This is are the defendants. There were a number and this was very criticized by the defense council. You see, this is the Dachau trial and the war crimes bench was established inside and within the concentration camp to try Germans. And it was led by Americans, and you can see by the bench, and it was a purely military trial. So Nuremberg trial, yeah, was not a criminal tribunal as we know nowadays, as we're used nowadays, but it was not at the same time a purely military tribunal. It was an hybrid tribunal between a military nature and a criminal international tribunal. Giovanni, before you go forward, I would like to ask you two questions. The first one is about the dissenting opinion. What is the position of the Italy in dissenting opinions? Is it existing in your court system that the judges give dissenting opinion? And how is it in common law and civil law countries in general? Can you give me a and the second one is the, about the military uniform at the bench. So we have a decision against Turkey when the military judges were sitting together with civilian judges at the bench and the European Court of Human Rights ruled that if in the bench one of the members is a military, this is against the independence of the justices because the accused person is going to think that the military judge is going to give his worst opinion and not be impartial. So the military uniform at the bench is a violation of fair trial against my opinion. What do you think about it? So thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ferdinand, for the interesting question. Uh, regarding the sending opinion, we don't have in Italy uh, any 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 norms about the dissenting opinion. Uh, we don't have. I would like, and I'm a promoter of the dissenting opinion, honestly, because I think uh, that when a decision is taken by a bench of three judges, or five judges, or nine judges, and in constitutional court, every judge has its own opinion, and it's a right to issue a dissenting opinion, a separate opinion, or a concurring opinion. And this is an instrument, in my opinion, <laughs> that is very useful for the evolution of the jurisprudence and also for a dialogue between the jurisprudence and the doctrine. Another norm that we have in Italy that is unacceptable for me is the judges are not allowed to mention doctrine in the judgment. This is something that on the contrary is very common in, in the international criminal law, for example, where doctrine are mentioned very, very commonly. 
Regarding the your observation, I, I agree with you, but you know we were in 1945, and after a world war, so it was a symbol of one of the main characteristics of the tribunal. That this was a military tribunal, so we need a military uniform in the bench. This was my opinion, and. I think we have to analyze it with the Russian approaches to international criminal law on that time. And Russian, you know, had a great loss in the battle with the Germans, millions of lives. So they probably wanted to underline and highlight the military nature of this tribunal. And one of the consequences to be military is issue a death penalty for all the convicted. This is my opinion, but I would like to also to hear your opinion and I would like to discuss also with your student if, if they have any questions. I'm very American approach on my lecture, so you can stop me whenever you want. So we may go on with your presentation. I can go forward. Let's see, go ahead. Let's see. OK. OK, so. After the Nuremberg, as you can see, and as you probably already know, the evolution of international procedure results in the constitution of the Tokyo trial, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. This is another essential tribunal in the history of international criminal trial. It's very underrated, but it's very important. And I will explain you why Tokyo trial represents one of the most important traits of international criminal procedure evolution. And also, if you don't know Tokyo trials, I'm of course talking to the students, you can see a very informative movie, which is Currently on Netflix, it's called Tokyo Trials. It's a good series. Uh, there are some historical, of course, it's not very precise, but it's a quite good introduction. Uh, the Tokyo Statute has only 17 articles, but more guarantees than Nuremberg. Why? The bench consisting, and I show you, of 11 judges, not of four judges. So differently from Nuremberg, where the judges was the representative of the victor's justice, here we have judges from India, from the Philippines, from China, from Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands. So 11 judges means, of course, more guarantees. And judges from different nations. And also here we have to, you know, go back in time. We are in 1946, 1947 after a terrible world war. So uh, another mark of evolution was also here the dissenting opinion. Five dissenting opinion were issued. And the most important dissenting opinion was the one of the Judge Powell. So the judge who is not sitting, the judge is one in the left we issued a dissenting opinion which is similar to a monograph. It's almost 1,000 pages and is still studied nowadays, uh, where he's also accused the colonial powers to commit some crimes. And just out of curiosity, do you know, the statue of this just, justice, Judge Paul, you can find it in Japan. They built a statue of Judge Powell because Judge Powell was a kind of idol in Japan, because in Japan, of course, they didn't recognize the authority of the Tokyo trial, especially after the one of the most terrible war crimes that had been committed in the world, namely the atomic bomb released on Japan, which was never prosecuted. So if you go to Japan, you can see the statue of the Judge Powell. Uh, usually I, I have some Japanese colleagues and the Tokyo trial is something that you cannot talk very easily about it. And I, I, I can understand, I can understand. It's something that they didn't recognize their authority. 
So the Tokyo trial represents the evolution of Nuremberg, but it's still an international military tribunal. Uh, there was a lot of challenges in the simultaneous translation. Imagine how to translate Japanese to Indian or Japanese to Dutch, uh, but also Japanese to English, which juridical term and legal English at that time was very difficult. Anyway, this represents a milestone in the affirmation of evolution of international criminal procedure. This was the General MacArthur, and I show you this was the Supreme Commander in the Tokyo trial, and it represents another symbol of evolution of international criminal procedure. You know why for the right to appeal? In Nuremberg, there was not a right to appeal the judge. There was not a right to appeal in Nuremberg. In Tokyo trial, the right to appeal was ensured, but it wasn't a judicial appeal. The right to appeal was directed to General MacArthur, and he decided, and he wrote a kind of appeal judgment. <laughs> so it was a kind of hybrid appeal, and this is another mark of this very military-oriented procedure. Let's go ahead, because time flies, and let's go to discuss the modern international criminal procedure. So after Nuremberg and Tokyo, international criminal justice remained silent for almost 50 years until the constitution of the so-called ad hoc tribunals established by the Security Council of the United Nations. You will surely know the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, both judging genocide. If the students already know about those tribunals, just let me know and I go ahead. Otherwise, I just I like some characteristic of this tribunal. In short, this is the International Tribunal for Yugoslavia. Uh, the revolution of these tribunals was essentially they were established and provided with a code of criminal procedure. On the contrary to the military tribunal, uh, this code of criminal procedure is called rules of procedure and evidence, but in fact is a code of criminal procedure. So this was the revolution of these tribunals to be provided with a real criminal procedure and judges were not allowed, as in Nuremberg, to create the procedural norms, even though they were allowed to amend the rules of procedure and evidence. But anyway, it's quite complicated. We called a doc tribunal with the Latin term a doc because they were created for a specific period of time for those specific territories and just for a limited starting period of jurisdiction from 1991 for the Yugoslavia, 1993 or 94 for Rwanda. They are still working after 30 years. They were unificated by the United Nations and now they are working under the name International Residual Mechanism for International Tribunal. I will show you some pictures. This is the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. This is still the logo of Yugoslavia and Rwanda. And this is nowadays the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. Uh, in fact, they are still working, but just they change the name and they fire some personal administration for financial issues. And we are finally arrived to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And I'm talking now about the current experience of International Criminal Court. So after the ad hoc tribunals, we are living nowadays a twofold experience characterized on one end by the presence of a permanent international criminal court 
created in Rome in 1998, which is autonomous from the United Nations, is depending from an assembly of the state parties, 125 state parties. Now it's 123. Because the Philippines and Uganda withdraw recently from the Rome Stat. But the International Criminal Court, I will say, is not alone. Because on the other end, there is a galaxy of little criminal courts that do not fall into any of the previous categories. These courts are characterized by the presence of international judges, but at the same time, influenced by the national legal system, which are defined as hybrid courts. Hybrid because a part is international as a part is national. Uh, usually, these courts adopted national criminal code, but the bench is composed by half judges from internationals and half judges from the national, and the same from the prosecutor. Which ones are they? And now I show you. And this is the courtroom of the International Criminal Court. If you want to visit one day, this is very interesting. Court. And this is the hybrid court. We start with the hybrid court. So pay attention because this is a very important back, backbones of international criminal proceedings. This is the most important hybrid court. It's called ACCC, which means Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. And it works with the United Nations assistance to Khmer Rouge trials. This court was established to try and judge the, the so-called Cambodian genocide the communist regime of Pol Pot, with two millions of victims, between two and three millions of victims. So it's a very important court. I'm currently working for this court because it's still ongoing as a legal counsel, so I, I can talk a lot for the confidentiality. But anyway, it's a very interesting court. The procedure of this court is a blend between Cambodian law so Southern Eastern system and French law. Very interesting court, uh, and I can send you some judgment if you're interested in deepening this argument for a thesis or something. This is the logo of the ACCC. This is the KSC. This is another court which is based in The Hague, and it's called KSC, which means Kosovo Specialist Chambers. This is also a very interesting core because it's managed by the EULEX, the European Union Agency, together with Canadian and uh, uh, Americans. It's still working. And if some of you is interested in undertaking an internship on starting an international career in an international tribunal, Remember that this court is the only court who pay interns. <laughs> so if you want to apply to some courts, apply to the Kosovo Specialist Chambers also because they pay interns. This is the logo of the Kosovo Specialist Chambers. Also, this procedure is mainly based on the Kosovo Criminal Code, so Balkan systems, but the bench and the prosecutor are half international. So it's an hybrid court and is based in The Hague, where the ICC is based. This is the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Another court is based in The Hague. So you see also hybrid courts are based in The Hague. There is a lot of courts in The Hague. And this court was created for the Lebanon case, as you know, now is almost ending its mandate. This court is the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic. It's another hybrid court. This is the Extraordinary African Chambers. It's another hybrid court. And this was the Iraq War Tribunal, which for some scholars is an hybrid court, but in my opinion, 
is more a military tribunal. So let's go ahead and let's go now to talk about ecocide. Anyway, this introduction was essential to understand, in my opinion, the International Criminal Court is indirectly affected by the presence of the hybrid courts. Imagine just the presence of the ACCC is judging a genocide of two million people, while the ICCC has, of course, ongoing proceedings, but mainly for war crime and crime against humanity. So, international criminal procedure is a galaxy of courts. It's not to be found only in the international criminal court. This is one of the main characteristics. And of course, regarding international criminal substantive law, you know, there are four international crimes, genocide, crime against humanity, war crime, and crime of aggression. The main difference between genocide and crime against humanity, just to sum up, is that in genocide, the prosecutor has to demonstrate the intent to disrupt or destroy, in whole or in part, a national, religious, ethnical, or racial group, whilst in the crime against humanity, he has to demonstrate that the crimes were committed as a part of a widespread and systematic attack against any civilian population. There is an interesting book written by Philip Sand, a London lawyer, professor in the UCL, which is called East West Street, which is very interesting and where it's clearly explained the difference between both crimes in a very narrative way. So it's very easy to read and it's a must to read in my opinion. So this was the history of international criminal procedure. Giovanni, and before you go on, I would like to ask again some questions to you. Sure. So you are describing us different international courts and some of them are named extraordinary. You mentioned one of the African courts as an extraordinary yeah. court. Yeah. My question is about this. According to our opinion, a court must be existing, established by the law before the crime has been committed. But in this international courts at the beginning, not ICC, but the previous ones, are most all, always established after the crime has been committed. So this is a special court that is going to be dealing with the Nuremberg court and the Tokyo court after the crimes have been committed. So th those are extraordinary courts. So what is your position about this extraordinary because we think it is illegal if it is established after the crime has been committed. And the second question related to this is the, 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 the procedure they are applying in their court rules. You mentioned those are a mixture of uh, adversarial and civil law countries procedures. So which is dominating one in, in which? So in Nuremberg, is it the civil law countries procedure dominating or the adversarial one? And did it can't lead it to a, a just judgment at the end? And the third question related to this is, what is the standards of the proof? Hmm. Who brings the evidence to the court? or the evidence, is it beyond reasonable doubt? Or is it by, as you said, demonstrate, demonstrate the, the judge, the prosecutor has to demonstrate the evidence you said. Is it, what is the standard of the proof? Is it right. different in each, in each one or is it a common uh, point in this international criminal court? Thank you, Professor Ferrino, for a very interesting question. 
and very tough questions. <laughs> it's hard, but I try to sum up. Uh, starting from the first question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. OK. When a court is called extraordinary, as you observe, it means that it's created usually after the crimes has been committed. So the principle of non-retroactivity is not respected. That's why are extraordinary. And that's why are established just to judge international crime. So uh, the justification is essentially this one. Since a two millions of genocide has been committed, and this cannot be tried by a national court itself because it's something that is too much for national judges and also national judges were probably involved in the commission of this crime or were probably a part of a regime we have to constitute a new international tribunal with a new legitimation and this legitimacy is to be found internationally but since the principle of non-retroactivity is a part of the essential of, inter of the criminal procedure, we have to apply national criminal procedure. So it's a compromise between international criminal law and criminal procedure principles. Uh, so we renounce to the principle of non-retroactivity, but just to judge a two million genocide crime, right? So this was the compromise that they reached for the external chambers in the court of Cambodia, for example. After the genocide trial is end, this court and its mandate, and they will not work again. So I know that for a criminal procedure scholar, this is difficult to understand. And I'm also a criminal procedure scholar, if you talk for inter with international lawyers, this is not a problem that they ask because for their for theirs it's normal. For us, it's not normal because the principle of no of no retroactivity usually prevails. It's a principle for of you know it's a principle of our law. But this could be sacrificed in case of a genocide or other international crimes has been committed at least as of Nuremberg and in the aftermath of Nuremberg. This was also a principle. Do you know the critical of Kelsen, the philosopher of law, was essentially based on the non-retroactivity principles. Also, Anna Arendt said something about non-retroactivity principles. And let me switch to the... I remember the third question about the standard of proof. Uh, and after I will, I will reply to the second question, but I kindly ask you to, to repeat me again. Regarding the standard of proof, uh, there are not standard of proof. They are the same in all the hybrid courts. Every hybrid court is different because every national criminal code is different. Uh, usually, for the new hybrid courts, namely the courts established as of 2002, they apply similar standard of the International Criminal Court, which means that the International Criminal Court has four different standards of proof. The first standard of proof is the reasonable basis to proceed, uh, is Articles 15 and 53 of the Rome Statute, uh, is there a standard of proof that applies for the preliminary examination reasonable basis to proceed. The second standard of proof is the reasonable basis to believe, which apply for the investigative phase. The third standard of proof is the reasonable ground to believe, so we're going upper and upper, for the warrant of arrest. And the fourth standard of proof is the substantial ground to believe for the confirmation of the charges. And also, of course, for the judgment, the International Criminal Court apply the beyond reasonable doubt standard. So it's similar 
to our legal culture in that case. Also, the beyond reasonable doubt applies to the common law anyway. And let me switch to the second question. Now I remember uh, it was about the juridical nature of the Nuremberg Statute, right? In my opinion, the Nuremberg Statute is 90% or probably 99% American criminal procedure. American criminal procedure. And there were also discussion between American and, and British about some differences of the procedure and especially this open clause that confer and allow judges to create their own procedural rules. This was something that is bound to American criminal procedure more than to British criminal procedure. But anyway, we cannot define the Nuremberg Statute as a fully American criminal procedure oriented because there were not a jury. There were not a jury. There were professional judges. So there were not a fully American criminal procedure statute. This, this is my, my answer. I, I know that I'm trying to sum up and I, I don't know how many time we have Professor Ferdinand. Is one hour 30 or one hour? Uh, I had to leave at 6.30. I have another meeting at 6.30. 6 6.30, uh, or Cyprus uh, time, which means, okay. A half an hour time uh, is your talk. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I think I will finish it. But we have also some questions from our room here in Istanbul. Nice. But I have additional question now about illegally obtained evidence. About... ICC statute especially, and uh, other international criminal procedures. What is the standard of illegally obtained evidence in, under ICC? Do they exclude the illegally obtained evidence? And how do they determine that uh, evidence is illegally obtained, obtained? Or is it just other standards other than illegally obtained? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this is another tough question. Uh, usually, also in the ICC, illegally obtained evidence is when an evidence is the result of torture or is obtained illegally, so without the presence of the defense counsel, as in every criminal procedure. However, I will say uh, that nowadays, and we are we are seeing that in the in the Russian Ukraine ongoing case, right? The evidence are mainly are mainly digital evidence in the international courts nowadays. Uh, if you see uh, in the Russian Ukraine case, there is some also some papers about uh, how to obtain digital evidence through social network. So the social network evidence are quite common in international criminal law. Uh, one example about the Ukraine-Russia case, uh, TikTok videos or Facebook videos or Instagram videos can be used as a digital evidence. But how is the standard for the reliability of that evidence? How can decide that the evidence is admittable or admittable? Uh, there is no a real or a dedicated standard of proof to that. I will say that the same standard of proof applied is the reasonable basis to believe. So if prima facie a video or a digital evidence for a social network, let me let me say still use this example, is considered reliable by the office of the prosecutor, the office of the prosecutor can go ahead and does the investigation, but have to seek the substantial ground to believe for the confirmation of the charges. So the uh, evaluation of the evidence is going to the end of a pretrial chamber, which has to decide the reliability of the evidence. But there is no a strict standard of proof about both illegal obtained evidence or the reliability itself of the evidence, for example, in case of digital evidence and also such a net network evidence. This is something quite different from our legal system, uh, at least in Italy and the US too, where a uh, TikTok videos, for example, is not considered so reliable, but this can be admittable in a war scenario 
for example, to film uh, that a uh, airplane is bombing an house near to you, uh, or a tank is bombarding your house. So there are different scenarios that allows step by step the mission of the evidence. There is no strict rules anyway in the statutory law about that. So it's left to the end of the interpreters. And this is, is different every time, also by the different legal culture of the judges. This is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. you may go on with your presentation, but towards the end, we have other questions from our room here. The participating I... students are preparing some questions for you. OK. So I'm going ahead and now Let's switch to the second part of the presentation, which is related to the new crime, the new fifth international crime. In addition to genocide, crime against humanity, war crime, and crime of aggression, it's ecocide. So this is the main part of the presentation. It's very interesting because the crime of ecocide has been discussed primarily by the international lawyer, but not by expert on criminal procedures. So this is a good element of discussion. Uh, as you probably already noted, the crime of ecocide is, is, and the discussion about the crime of ecocide is quite common in the, in the doctrine, right? And also on social network or social media. But the creation of the crime of ecocide is not to be found in 2021 when the Stop Ecocide Foundation put forward its proposal, but is to be found in 1969. <clears throat> 1969, and it's related to the Vietnam War. The creation of the term ecocide, taking its cue from the UN Genocide Convention, of course, is attributable to a doctor, not to a jurist. Dr. Arthur Galston. Galston was an American botanist and director of the Division of Biological Science at Yale in the US. So the breakthrough of ecocide was not juridical, but scientific was related to environmental science more than law. Uh, he described the effect of the so-called Agent Orange, it's a defoliant, a chemical herbicide, used during the Vietnam War by American troops, and it was released to destroy the crops and expose Viet Cong position and routes of movement in the vast forests of both Vietnam and Cambodia the former Indochina. So American troops released an estimated 20 million gallons of this chemical herbicide, which is like an era as the state of Massachusetts, in addition to other chemicals like Agent Blue, Agent White, and a lot of chemicals were reused with different colors, and they were the fire ra rainbow chemicals. And I show you some picture just to understand. This was the rainbow herbicides used in the Vietnam era to destroy vegetation, agriculture, and expose the Viet Cong position. So this is the Air Force spray, the forest of Vietnam. And this is the effect of ecocide caused by the Agent Orange. So this is an aerial photograph from Texas, from the archive of Texas Tech University. In the land on the left, as in be Sprite, while the land on the right has. Can you see the, the photos, right, Professor Ferry? Can you see the photos? Yeah. Can students see the photos, I hope? Yes, OK. So, 
Can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so you can see on the left the appealing effect of the defoliation which constitutes ecosystem. So a terrible effect for the nature. This was also effects against children with disabilities because of Agent Orange. And this was ongoing protests in Vietnam about the Vietnam War and the Agent Orange. So they designed child with disabilities. Anyway. The government of Vietnam said that up to 4 million people were exposed to this defoliant. And Arthur Galston put forward a definition of ecocide and a tripartition of the ecocide damage, which is still pertinent. For Galston, ecocide has a triple damage. Of course, one is ecological, the second is agricultural, and the third involves direct damage to the people. And he also noted that this defoliant was used by the British Army in the Malayan Emergency in 1948. So that was not new in the military panorama. Anyway, Galson revelation regarding the Vietnam War led the former US President Nixon to order a halt to its use, and the US Army stopped the chemical aggression in Vietnam. So one year later in Washington, in a conference on war and national responsibility, Gaston proposed a plea to ban ecocide. And his pioneering view constitutes the affirmation of ecocide. So the affirmation of ecocide is to be found in 1969, and ecocide as a term is a neologism derived from the Greek and Latin language, from the Greek oikos, which means house, home, and the Latin cedere, which means to destroy, to kill. So to kill our house, this is ecocide, to kill our house, our environment. Lately, in 1972, in the UN Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment, Discussion about ecocide were put forward by the Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Bell. It was the head of state and other head of state also included Indira Gandhi, Tanki, and many anyway, other other leaders from China, India. Olaf Bell, the Swedish Prime Minister, said very important words and expressly that the air we breathe is not the property of any one nation, so we have to recognize ecocide as an international crime without borders. And we are in 1972 without an uh, international criminal court. Anyway, this is, was the affirmation of ecocide in nine, between 1969 and 1972. And let me go ahead to the first juridical definition now. Here we are. In 1973, we find the first juridical proposal written by Richard Falk, a professor in Yale, America. Professor Falk started from the environmental war for in the China, so he's still in the Vietnam War, proposed an international convention including a very precise juridical definition and a long list of criminal conduct. For Professor Falk, he can say means any act committed with the intent to disrupt or destroy in whole or in part a human ecosystem. So he reminds me every time the formulation of genocide, right? Genocide is an act committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national religious racial or ethnic group, and ecocide is to destroy a human ecosystem. But the same mass area, the same mental element in the five proposal. So it was a very similar current in clear definition to the Angelus Convention. 
He proposed the list of several possibilities, such as the use of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, bacteriological weapons, chemicals, herbicides, and also technique designed to increase or decrease rainfall or to modify weather as a weapon of war. He also inserted the forcible removal of human beings or animals from their habitable places. Anyway, this is a long list. You can easily find the Richard Fire proposal, and I can forward it later to you, to Professor Faridon, if someone of you is interested in deepening this argument. Juridically speaking, the Fox draft will be divided in two parts one of substantive law and one about procedure. So as you can see in the slide, regarding substantive law, he proposed the conspiracy to commit ecocide, the public incitement to ecocide, the attempt, and in addition, he provided that the constitutionally responsible rulers, public officers, military commanders, as well as private individuals may all be charged and convicted with crimes associated to ecocide. And similarly, he provides that who committed ecocide shall be punished at least to the extent of being removed for a period of years from any position of leadership or public trust. So he created a definition of ecocide who can apply also to head of state political leaders. But we are in 1972, and as I said before, without an International Criminal Court, and nowadays we will talk maybe later, but the International Criminal Court has some statutory law limits to prosecute especially corporation, but we, we can talk later about it. Regarding the procedural structure, the fact proposal was really interesting as he proposed a special commission for the investigation of ecocide composed of 15 experts on international law assisted by a staff conversant with ecology. This was a great idea, in my opinion, that we cannot find in the recent proposal and constitutes the first in the interconnection between environmental science and international criminal law. Ecocide is a special crime that needs the assistance of scientific experts to be upshared. To. Jurists are not enough, in my opinion. Do you know which university is from? Uh, Richard Falk is from? Which university is from? Yale. Yale in America. Yale in America. University of Yale. Okay, and this is this uh, procedural uh, uh, proposal. Adopted. So he proposed, yeah, he proposed both a substantive law and procedural proposal. But we are in 1972. Uh, after I will talk about the new proposal and the proposal that I write in Ireland for the Center of Criminal Justice highlighting only procedural issue. But this juridical proposal is interesting because in the procedure, he left the door open to a double jurisdiction in Article 7 and 10, and he proposed the establishment of a new international competent tribunal for the crime of ecocide, so a new international tribunal, or otherwise, he proposed the establishment of a criminal chamber within the International Court of Justice. But this is an historical reason, because in 1972, the only International Court was the International Court of Justice. Even if it was not a criminal chamber, he proposed the creation of a special chamber within the International Court of Justice, which is quite interesting. This also its proposal was revolutionary at that time. And it constitutes for sure the, the genesis of ecocide. And he also alleged that ecocide shall not be considered as a political crime for the purpose of extradition, and it therefore obligates states to pledge themselves to grant extradition in such case of ecocide. Anyway, there is a limit in the FAG proposal, namely 
Fox defined the crime as a mer war crime, as a mer war crime and not as a crime against humanity. So in the history of ecocide, ecocide has been discussed as a mer war crime. Only nowadays we can talk about ecocide as a crime against humanity. And this makes more sense, in my opinion, because the crime of ecocide also occurred during time of peace and not only during war. And moreover, you know, during war crimes and war crimes, if there is a military advantage, you cannot prove the war crime. So ecocide as a war crime would be very limited. This was the FAR proposal. After the FAR proposal, the political community and the law community discussed a lot about ecocide, but they never put forward a definition of ecocide. So there were mainly 20 years of debate and political debate, which is not very interesting, and you can find in the special rapport of Nikodem Lukashenko or Benjamin White Taker in 1978 and 1985. Usually I go ahead to this part uh, 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 because it's very political. There is there is not a lot of juridical question here and we don't have a lot of time. So let's go ahead and let's go to the Rome Statute talking about law. In the Rome Statute, the only crime against the environment is Article 8, Paragraph 2, Letter B, Number 4. There is no trace about ecocide. The Assembly of State Parties decided not to insert ecocide in the Rome Statute and to insert the crime of aggression only later. And as we see, prove that the crime of aggression nowadays is quite impossible because it's required the consent of the aggressor state, which is very unlikely. In the Rome Statute, we are going one step back comparing to the FAR proposal. For the Rome Statute, war crime also means long-term and severe damage to the natural environment, which will be clearly excessive in relation to the concrete and direct overall military advantage anticipated. So this is a very difficult norm to demonstrate for a prosecutor. It's a complicated norm. First, the norm is limited to international armed conflict. Moreover, if we're going to read the norm, the actus reus must be widespread, severe, and and causing long-term environmental damage. The actus reus cannot have been committed as a part of concrete military advantage, and the mens rea must be intentional. So this Article 8, as a war crime, demands a very high threshold of injury to the environment before an act will fall within the scope of the crime itself. And the use of the conjunctive form, and, between the words widespread and long term and severe, rather than the disjunctive form, is a regression from the standard that had been specified in the Convention, for example, on prohibition of military uh, use of environmental modification, where the disjunctive form is used. They choose to use the conjunctive end between the words widespread, long term, and severe, in my opinion result in an impossibility to prosecute this crime. And so in the history of International Criminal Court, there is no case of prosecution of Article 8, Paragraph 2, Letter B, Number 4. Regarding the military advantage, for example, just to understand what the military advantage, Give a look to the old Master Bridge case before the Adopt Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. When the 16th century Ottoman bridge in the city of Mostar in Bosnia was destroyed by the Croat paramilitary force. This was also a mediatic case because the defendant suicided himself drinking a poison during the public hearing, if you remember, a couple of years ago. 
And here the trial chamber said initially that there was military advantage. The decision was overturned by the appeal chamber anyway, by imaging the old Monster Bridge case. <laughs> The, the, there was military advantage in the, in the first opinion, so this is, was unacceptable, right? That's why crime against the environment or crime against cultural heritage cannot be classified as a mere war crime, in my opinion. Anyway, re returning to Article 8 of the Rome Statute, I want to spend some good words for it because in any case, is the first ecocentric crime recognized by the international community. But at one step back, since the, since the classification as a mere war crime is still not enough for both exigence of prevention and protection of the environment. Uh, Giovanni, thank you for this very interesting talk today. But we have to conclude in 10 minutes. Oh, OK. OK, sorry. OK. Conclude to the end. And we have two more questions for you. OK, so let me let me go ahead to Ecoside. Nowadays, Ecoside is mainly managed by the Stop Ecoside Foundation. I'm trying to sum up in 10 minutes. And stop me if I go ahead. Uh, the Stop Ecoside Foundation is a very social oriented foundation created in 2021 who put forward a new definition of ecocide. Uh, for the Stop Ecoside Foundation, ecocide is any lawful or wanton act committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long term damage to the environment. And they if you can see the slide, I go fast. They had the support, you know, of the community. They created a very, very social also media. You see Greta Thunberg, environmental activist. And this is a very social campaign to be the Pope, <laughs> to, to insert the crime of ecocide within the Rome Statute. The actors, etc. Uh, I'm going. Ahead. This is the 12 lawyers who put forward the definition of ecocide, and there was a lot of criticism about it. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, anyway, what's the problem of the definition of the Stop Ecocide Foundation? There are a lot of requirements. There are a lot of requirements. Let me return here to the Stop Ecoside Foundation proposal. Uh, wanton, severe, widespread, and long term. What does that mean? Wanton means when an act is committed with reckless disregard. Severe means a damage which involves in a disruption to any element of the environment, including grave impacts on human life or natural life. Widespread, this is probably the most difficult requirements, means a damage which extends beyond a limited geographical area that crosses the state boundaries or is suffered by an entire ecosystem or species or a large number of human beings. And of course, you cannot classify it all of the conducts possible liability, but you should left to the judges and to the doctrine this evolution of the term. But widespread is a very difficult requirement. And long term means a damage which is irreversible or which cannot be redressed through a natural recovery within a reasonable period of time. Imagine, for example, a nuclear disaster. A nuclear disaster could constitute both a long term <laughs> and widespread and of course severe uh, damage, but it has to be wanton. So committed with reckless disregard. This is very international oriented. Uh, also the definition of the environment, we could intend the environment, lato sensu, we could say in Latin, uh, which means not only the earth, but the biosphere, the cryosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, 
and also the outer space. What's the problem of the procedural definition? And we put forward amendment, but usually it takes uh, usually it takes three lectures to, to finish the presentation. I try to sum up. There is several problems that are connected with the ROM statue, but maybe we can talk also in the question and answer. In short, jurisdiction ratione temporis, namely temporal jurisdiction in their own statute, allow states to withdraw, to withdraw for their own statute just by giving notice to the UN and then withdraw as the Philippines or of Uganda. And the ICC is based on the principle of no retroactivity, so a state can easily escape from being prosecuted from the crime of ecocide, just, just withdrawing within one year. There is a problem regarding the deferral of, the, of investigation or prosecution, since the UN Security Council can ask the prosecutor for a deferral of 12 months, and this deferral can be put forward with any time limit. So there is an interconnection between the prosecutorial power and the UN Security Council. This is a very a special trait of the International Criminal Court, uh, which you cannot find in other courts. Uh, under the Rome Statute, the UN Security Council can order that no investigation or prosecution may be proceed for a period of 12 months after the Security Council has requested the court. And you know, remember the fight permanent of the Security Council namely the big powers. The third amendment is regarding the introduction of aggravated ecocide in the context of climate change, and then a change in the standard of proof, introducing a special standard of proof of sufficient basis if the information of crimes are coming from environmental authorities. This is another interesting amendment. And the rebuttal of presumption of both gravity and the interest of justice which are issues of admissibility in the Rome Statute, which are very essential in the preliminary examination, um, as well as the procedural admission of guilt. We don't have time to talk about that. We probably need another hour. I, I thought we had another hour, so I'm sorry, it's my fault. Uh, but we, we can discuss in the question and answer the main doubts that you have. So I. I'm available in, in, in the question and answer. It was the proposal and, uh, that, that we put forward uh, regarding investigation, preliminary examination, and, and the, the main procedure requirements that characterize the, the Rome Statute. Uh, just remember. Just, just a thought. You may have sent the uh, PowerPoint you are sending. Uh, displaying here and the students are very much interested to have the details about this yeah for sure i will i will send i will send the details and a comment and if you want we can open the question otherwise i just spent two minutes saying uh, something just starting now and i have to close now unfortunately. okay and okay it was interesting again and thank you very much for participating I think we should be going to post you again in the future and ask you more questions as soon as possible. <laughs> oh, I'm glad, glad to be here, glad to be there again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. much.